Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Danielle Tomasello. I'm a postdoc at the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research, and I'm actually joined here with our own institute director, uh, Ruth Lehman. Want to give a little shout out to her? Hi, Ruth. <laughs> um, so we're hosting today uh, to give a bit more information about review comments. So we have an excellent panel put together with the two co-founders um, and we had some editors and even an, uh, an author that's gone through the process. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to Jessica Polka from ASAP Bio who's gonna introduce the panelists. Thank you so much, Danielle. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to, to be here to help to run through these slides and introduce the panel. ASAP Bio, um, as some of you may be aware, is a small nonprofit that works to accelerate research communication through the productive use of preprints and open peer review. Um, and we have been collaborating with EMBO um, to kind of get review commons started and uh, I'm excited today to tell you a little bit more about how we're gonna uh, go through the agenda for today's webinar. So I would love to encourage everyone who is attending today to use the Q&A feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. This will enable you to upvote one another's questions. You can comment on each other's questions. Um, and uh, this way we can keep all of the questions organized and we can answer them directly. You uh, can press this little thumbs up button if you like to uh, upvote a question to make sure that we get to it. And you also have the opportunity to send those questions anonymously. Please note that we are recording this webinar and we plan to post it online. So uh, if you, we may use your name as we call out the questions. So please do uh, check that uh, anonymity box if you would like to remain anonymous through this process. Um, a few reminders, just as a, a point of reference for the code of conduct. Um, please do, of course, keep your questions or any discussion professional, courteous, respectful, uh, and refrain from discussing any confidential details about manuscripts. We do reserve the right to uh, remove any um, potentially disruptive participants. Um, so just as a little bit of orientation today, uh, I'm first going to welcome Ron Vale and Maria Lepton to discuss uh, the why of Review Commons, the motivation for the service, uh, next, you'll be hearing uh, from Sarah Monaco about how it works, and then Tomas Lumberger about the evaluation and of the data that we've collected, uh, and finally, an author perspective from Harmeet Malik. And then we will go back into the Q&A um, as directed by all of you. So please uh, don't hesitate through this entire process to add those questions to the Q&A feature, and we will address them at the end all at once. Okay, so with that, uh, I will uh, turn over the microphone to Ron Vale, who's the executive director of Genalia uh, and also a co-founder of Review Commons. Great, well, thank you, Jessica, and thank you to the postdocs of the Whitehead for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be here to help spread the gospel, and I hope you will too. And uh, of course, uh, answer uh, any questions that you have. Um, I'm just going to speak just for a couple minutes on um, uh, where kind of the idea and then the evolution of Review Commons came from. Uh, the origin started actually a very important meeting in 2018. Uh, ASAP IO uh, had its first kind of international conference on preprints in 2016. And a 2018 meeting was uh, devoted to really discuss the future of peer review in biology uh, with a, a goal of really thinking through peer review as a community of how to make peer review more constructive, uh, transparent, and efficient. Um, it was a lively uh, discussion. Um, and uh, one of the ideas that was put forward actually in, in this white paper was uh, the idea of putting together a, a new kind of peer reviewing that would uh, occur um, independent of the traditional uh, uh, journal system. Uh, and it would start with uh, a preprint 
that would get evaluated in a um, uh, journal agnostic way, meaning evaluated uh, for its science. And that after that uh, review process, uh, there, it's now called a uh, refereed preprint, not evaluated preprint, that um, the refereed work could then be matched with uh, a journal that would uh, then publish that work. Well, you know, it's very easy to come up with a white paper. It's a lot harder to uh, translate things into action. And that's when uh, a great, great partnership started initially with uh, um, uh, a really wonderful conversation that I had with Maria Lepton in San Francisco. And, uh, and Maria um, and Embo and ASAP Bio then really started this uh, journey together. I would say a lot of other uh, uh, systems have now been uh, adopting something very similar, but um, uh, you know I, I think this concept of this uh, journal agnostic uh, peer review started here. And so, what 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 is Review Commons? What is it trying to achieve? Uh, so, first of all, we all know that the current system is really something needs to happen. Uh, uh, people submit to a journal, um, it gets rejected, it, all of that peer review then is wasted, it goes to another journal, the same process could happen again. And this uh, system of serial journal submissions is, is, is not good for authors, it's not good for the people that review papers, and it, it's simply the way it's going, just not sustainable. So putting one upfront review and then matching it to a journal would create more efficiency in the system. Uh, our goal also overall, and it should be a goal of the whole publishing system, is, is to make reviews and author responses um, scholarly pieces of work that actually are transparent and available to the community for evaluation. Um, that's part of the goal of what you'll hear about as refereed preprints. Um, and we also believe, and you'll hear about, I think later as we talk about that, um, uh, we believe that uh, if refereeing occur, occurs in a journal agnostic way, meaning that you know, referees are reviewing the science and not really acting as a consultant uh, for a particular journal, that will really focus their peer reviewing process on uh, what the science is about, uh, and um, also even working in partnership with the author to make the science better. And you know, lastly, um, everyone knows about preprint. I think the concept of adding a layer of um, review to the preprint creates kind of a, a unique product, which is a referee preprint, which we feel will be very valuable um, in the current and future um, um, even ecosystem of where publishing may be going in the future. Uh, so with that, I'll pass things over to my wonderful friend and colleague and uh, partner in crime in this whole journey, and that's uh, Maria Lepton. Okay. Hi, all. Can, can you hear me? Right. I can only um, agree with everything that Ron said, of course. Um, I, just a few additional remarks. I think what's important to remember is that Review Commons, as Ron said, came from the community. It started as something from the community. Um, it nearly died until that fateful meeting in, in Ron's lab in San Francisco, when we meant to talk about science, but we both had something churning in our bellies that wanted out and it did out. But it came from this ASAP, uh, from this meeting at the at HHMI, which was a group of uh, people from research. Funders were there, journals were there. And there was clearly a need, a desire for change. Um, as is often the case, if you get a whole bunch of scientists together, they get excited, but everybody has slightly different ideas and you can't agree on the consensus. And so all the good ideas that, um, that, that, that were born there sort of began to diverge and uh, nothing happened, but it was born from a desire in the community. And so the nice thing is that, that, that um, Ron and I 
you know, we then just said, let's do it. Uh, we drew on a blackboard. I was just looking for the picture. I have it somewhere. We should give that to ASAP Bio, by the way, um, and came up with an idea which has evolved and evolved and evolved. And um, uh, it's good that a community wish has come true. Um, so the other thing that came out of that, actually, that should not be forgotten and, with, and which shows that a drive from the community can be successful and can lead to massive change is bioarchive. That didn't exist then. And that was the first outcome of one of these meetings. And who would have thought that by now it is normal for our communities to post preprints? It's, you know, nobody talks about it anymore. We just all do it, um, which is great. But we've also over the last year seen some of the dangers of posted preprints that are not refereed. And so that needs further change. We need to get the most out of preprints, um, regardless of what journals, I mean, the way, the way Review Commons runs is that eventually the papers are, the idea is that they end up in, in, in journals, but we actually have something here that would make that unnecessary and that would help the community even more by just having the referees uh, views critique and the author's responses there publicly visible and Thomas will tell us a little bit about uh, the achievements of review Commons then. So really two big changes uh, from from a grassroots meeting. I think that's a wonderful uh, success. So um, again, as Ron said, the major goals are efficiency and um, speed. That's the ASAP. You know, that is, is, is clearly one. The funny thing is that, that we're, we've begun to see a side effect as well. Um, the journal independent reviewing means what it says. It's journal independent. And it has led to a, to, to also to an increase in quality. It's quite funny because the first authors, the first referees who were asked, some of them were quite puzzled about having to uh, review a paper and not say what journal it's for. And they said, you know, how, how, how can we? I mean, how can I critique this if I don't know what journal is for? Meaning, you know, how do I know whether I should ask for three more experiments or ex just look at the science? So that had to be relearned, uh, especially by the younger people. It's quite terrible how, um, how the idea of refereeing has been perverted as uh, the referees acting as editors. That's what editors are for. They're supposed to decide. I always, I, ne I never give, when I referee, I never give advice to the editors. It's their job. Anyway, so we've seen efficiency, uh, less time wasted on refereeing, less time wasted by authors on resubmitting, and in fact, less time wasted by journals in re-refereeing stuff that's already been refereed. But we've also seen uh, an increase in quality of reviewing, and I'll be very interested to hear uh, from authors uh, their experiences. Um, so um, it, it seems to have lots of beneficial effects, and um, we're hoping to hear from you what it's done for you, what more it can do for you, and um, then see whether we can get this embedded in a broader science culture. So I want to thank the postdocs on the Whitehead for organizing this. It's really great. Um, we love to engage with the community. We're here for the community exclusively. That's our main interest. And so we look forward to hearing feedback from you. And I'll hand back to Jessica to move to the next agenda item. Thank you so much, Maria. And thank you, Ron, for setting the stage, setting the context, and helping us understand the motivation of Review Commons. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Sarah Monaco, who is the managing editor of uh, the platform, who will explain a little bit more about how it actually works. Over to you, Sarah. Hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks a lot to the Whitehead Postdoc Association for this uh, very nice invitation. Uh, so now I will, uh, um, I will give a little presentation about uh, how Review Commons uh, works. Can you see it? Yeah, good. Okay, so um, Review Commons is a journal independent platform that provides peer review before submission to a journal. And it is a project that was born in collaboration between uh, EMBO and uh, Asabio. So the main goal of Review Commons is to accelerate the dissemination of peer reviewed science. So our authors have the possibility to post their uh, refereed preprint um, before the, the, the manuscript is accepted in a journal. 
We also want to eliminate multiple cycles of peer review of the same manuscript at different journals. And to do that, we have created a unique consortium of 17 journals that all agreed uh, to consider our uh, portable reviews without starting the process from scratch. And finally, we also want to spark a cultural shift in peer review. And in particular, we want the reviews to be focused only on the science, regardless from a possible journal fit, as Ron was mentioning. So um, uh, for that, we have implemented a journal agnostic peer review that I am going to talk into details later. So our editorial team is composed by myself and Thomas that you are meeting today. And then there is Georgia, our editorial assistant, and you will have a lot of uh, communication with her if you submit to review comments. And lately also Tiago, who is our expert in community outreach and also our blog editor, because recently review comments also launched uh, a blog, which is called uh, the commons. And I invite you to visit it at this, uh, uh, at this website. So there you will find news about our latest uh, uh, refereed preprints, but it is also a forum for discussion about uh, um, scientific publishing and, and science in general. Um, it's very important for us uh, to have uh, on board our ad uh, academic advisory board, uh, which is composed by young group leaders uh, who are very engaged with the, uh, with the process and that help us to make our editorial decision on whether to send the manuscript out for peer review. So also in this case, uh, this decision is completely journal independent and it is based only on uh, the advance that the manuscript provides in the field and, uh, and uh, the novelty. And I want to mention also that our peer review is, uh, um, is handled by uh, the editors of the uh, Embo Press family. So they are the editors of the journals of Embo Press. And this was very important for us because it allowed us to uh, offer very high quality peer review from the very beginning of the launching of Review Commons. Um, so in terms of workflow, we receive manuscripts in form of uh, uh, preprints or as direct submissions. Uh, after this initial pre-selection, the manuscript is assigned to uh, three reviewers that comment on them in a journal agnostic way. When we receive the reviews, we send them back to the authors without making any decision. And at this point, the authors can post their manuscript plus their reviews and their responses on BioArchive and MedArchive, creating the refereed preprint, which is the first outcome of Review Commons, which is even independent from publication in a journal. But of course, we know that um, authors still want to publish, so we give them the opportunity to post the same composite document to, uh, to, to submit uh, to one of our uh, journals. And the key feature of Review Commons is that if the first journal rejects the manuscript, the authors can resubmit it again with the same set of reviews to another journal, and they can do that up to four times. So the journal will make a decision based on the manuscript and the revisions, and if everything goes well, the manuscripts uh, uh, will get uh, published in one of our journals. So as you can see, um, Review Commons has two different outcomes. One is the classical published paper, and another one is the refereed preprint. And uh, we, um, we strongly believe in the value of refereed preprint to what they mean for the scientific community, for open science, and for the authors themselves. And to help uh, the um, scientific community to better navigate across, um, across refereed preprints, we have created uh, a platform, which is called Early Evidence Base, that aggregates refereed preprints across multiple services. So not only from Review Commons, but also from similar platforms. So we are still working on this very new platform and we are constantly improving it. And uh, you can find their uh, preprints and refereed preprints also according to topics. So um, the success of Review Commons relies a lot on its consortium that includes preprint servers uh, like BioArchive and MedArchive and also journals. And our journals belong to different publishing groups like Embo Press, eLife, Company of Biologists, PLOS, uh, and also journals like MBUC and JCB. So they uh, have different scopes and uh, acceptance criteria. So we are confident that all the manuscripts that get reviewed by Review Commons could find a home in one of these journals. Uh, another important feature of Review Commons is the journal agnostic peer review. And to help our reviewers to articulate their reviews in a way that they are really 
journal agnostic, we have uh, uh, created very clear and transparent guidelines. So uh, we ask them to comment on, uh, um, uh, to evaluate the paper as it is and not as it could be to satisfy a specific journal standard. So we ask them to make major comments on how convincing the conclusions are and to suggest new experiments only if they belong to the scope of the manuscript. Of course, they can also comment on the technical part of the study and, uh, um, and, uh, uh, and the soundness of the data. And in our review, we also have this important part, which we call significant, that helps to contextualize uh, the new uh, findings uh, into, uh, into the context of the existing literature. So we ask the reviewers to comment on which kind of advance the manuscript provides, if it is clinical, conceptual, methodological, and so on, and to comment on the novelty. And finally, we also have uh, a, another very transparent session in our peer review process, which we called referees cross commenting, in which reviewers can see each other's report and they can comment on each other, creating a sort of collaborative peer review. Um, another special thing about review commons is the possibility to submit a revision plan instead of a full revision. And you see displayed here the two templates that we, um, that we offer on our website to help the others to understand better what, what, what this means. So you know that in the classical system, uh, when you re resubmit your paper to a journal, you prepare a full revision. So you prepare a point by point response in which you describe um, the experiments, the analysis and the modification that you have done to your manuscript in order to uh, address the reviewer's comments. So in review comments, you can still do that but you can also opt for a revision plan. So the revision, the difference is that it, with the revision plan, you describe the experiments and the analysis that you are, are going to do to address the reviewer's point. Of course, if you have already done something, you can also include it. And you also have the possibility to describe the experiments that you are not willing to do because probably they are irrealistic or they do not belong to the scope of the manuscript or uh, you simply don't have the time and resources to perform them. So since you can submit the manuscript to different journals, it is useful to test the interest of a journal before committing to do a full revision. Okay, so I would like to conclude uh, introducing a new policy of Review Commons that will uh, um, be valid from the 1st of August, and it is the mandatory posting of preprints at the latest at the moment of submission to one of our journals. So please note that I am here referring to preprints and not refereed preprints because at the moment posting of reviews remains optional in Review Commons. But you also have to consider that the reviews will be published anyway at the latest when the paper is accepted in uh, one of our journals. Uh, but we are aware that the main concern of, uh, of scientists in posting preprints is the fear of being scooped. So in return to this policy, we have managed to get an extended scooping protection of preprints in all our 17 journals. So this means that you submit, if you submit your manuscript to a journal and in the meantime you are scooped, you are protected from scooping from the date of posting preprints. So uh, we hope that with this uh, new policy, we will encourage more and more the posting of preprints, uh, also in research field in which this is not so common. And uh, we also want to propose referee preprint as a new medium to communicate science and to uh, um, accelerate the dissemination of peer reviewed so solid science. Okay, so with this, I uh, conclude. I um, invite you to visit our website and I give back the microphone to Jessica. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, incredibly informative. Uh, and now I would like to welcome Thomas Sundberger, who is the Deputy Head of Scientific Publications at Envo Press and also the Project Lead of Review Commons to explain what we've learned about how the system is working. Okay, well, thank you very much. I hope you can see the slides and hear me. Um, okay, cool. So, so this is this is, by the way the historical whiteboard a genius uh, scheme for Maria and Ron that sort of laid a very clear and crisp ground for review comments. Um, so this is where it very all started. Very funny, Thomas. <laughs> this is where, where it all started. And you, you see that all the ideas were, were actually there. So Sarah presented you <clears throat> with this workflow that we, we have at Review Commons to conduct the peer review, post a referee preprint, um, uh, uh, enhance the, the submission uh, process, 
um, and finally published the paper. So we wanted to measure a little bit some critical checkpoints of this workflow to see whether it works. Because of course, from the original scheme to, to a, a real implementation in real life, there, there is really a long path. So the, the first thing uh, that we did was to ask actually our authors what did they think about this journal independent peer review, which is fair, you know, it was very far from from trivial when we started, whether it it would work at all, frankly. Um, so we ran a, a survey last summer, and we're going to renew that now, where we asked the authors where what they, did they feel about this review, the, these reviews, were they more uh, transparent, where they were less biased than, than usual reviews, uh, whether they were fair. And in blue, you see the, the fraction of authors who feel that review comments uh, did better than journals, and, and in red, you see the fractions, uh, the fraction of authors who felt that the journal uh, do better. And I think it's it's fair to say, without going now in all the details, that authors receive this, this, this review com and these review comments uh, reviews very favorably, and, and they really support very strongly um, that process. One quote, undoubtedly the, the best thing is the sense of forward momentum. Every step forward feels, uh, feels like a step completed instead of an iterative cycle. And this is really what, what we wanted to achieve. So the, the, the second point in this workflow um, was, was a very tricky one, uh, and it was to see whether the journals were really respecting this sort of promise not to start the peer review uh, from scratch, which again was very far from trivial. We, ha we had a sort of gentleman agreement with a with, with the journals, but no, nothing legally binding or, or, or the like. But and we were not quite sure whether, in practice, that would really pan out. And, and that was a, a really nice result to see. You see on the left uh, manuscripts that have been accepted by um, the affiliated journals, and essentially all of them, 98 percent. That's as close as it goes to 100 percent. Uh, were accepted without involving any additional reviewers. So, so the journals really played the game. You see on the right the rejected manuscripts, a little bit more extra consultation with an advisory board, with maybe a specialist in, in, in a given field. But by and large, I think we have essentially eliminated all the, the repeated cycles of peer review. The third point <clears throat> is whether um, the, the, the journal independent peer review can be used in practice now to make a final decision and, and publish a paper. Again, that was not um, a, a trivial, and, and so we followed the, the fate of the papers uh, that have been reviewed by review comments. You see on the left here the distribution of the accepted papers in red, the PLOS group, in green, the Ambo Press journals, yellow, eLive, in blue, the Company of Biologists. And then we have a Rockefeller University Press with JCB and, and uh, ESCB with uh, molecular biology of the cell. You see a fairly um, homogeneous distribution ac across the, the big groups. Uh, one thing I want to, to point out is that at several journals, the acceptance rate of review comments uh, papers is actually higher than the nominal acceptance rate at that journal, suggesting that there is an enrichment in good manuscripts. I think there is some kind of self-selection. It, it is also consistent with the idea that that in presence of peer review, the authors choose the, the, their target journal in a more informed way and, and maybe in a more lucid way that allows them to, to reach uh, very efficiently um, a publication. Uh, and, and finally, maybe the most important, uh, Sarah explained, I think, very clearly, or all of us, we, we explained very clearly, our aim is to accelerate publication, accelerate the diffusion of peer-reviewed research uh, with this object, the referee preprint, but also the final paper. So did we achieve that? And, and we try to have a, as empirical approach as possible. Uh, on the left, you, you see a, a, scatter, a scatter plot of the normal classical journal publishing. We, we used here our own data from Embo Press. Every dot is one paper, and we pulled papers that have been accepted at Embo Press, but also the rejected papers uh, for which we could automatically retrieve the, the ultimate fate in, a, in another journal after so often many months and after 
often many uh, serial submissions. You see the median, 253 days. Uh, you see an enormous spread uh, up to several years, which is the, the classical uh, experience that we know. And note that this 253 days is actually a lower bound estimation, uh, since we do not know what is the past history before these papers come to Embo Press. Now, in red, this is the referee preprint. Look at the difference, 71 days. This includes 30 days of peer review, 30 days of uh, revision to formulate uh, initial revision plan and a point by point that is ready to be posted. Uh, the peer reviews are posted on, on, on BioArchive. The peer reviewed research is already available now for researchers to use, to reuse, and to think about. Now, of course, preprint, uh, uh, referee preprints are very nice, but I think uh, we are all interested also in publishing a paper, a final paper that goes in the scientific record. So is this also faster? The answer is yes. Within the Review Commons uh, Affiliate Journal, it takes 181 days instead of 253 days as median time to, to publish a paper. So this reflects the absence of the serial peer reviews that delays uh, completely the, uh, and derails the, the publishing process. So these are, are the data that I wanted to, to show you. I think we can say it works. The authors support very strongly the journal independent peer review process. Cycles of peer review were eliminated and the dissemination of peer reviewed research is, is much faster. And, and I can't resist to say, if you like that, why don't you go and download your poster and put it in your lab uh, to encourage other and to inform others of, of, of the existence of review comments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, and now, uh, finally, I'm thrilled to welcome Hermine Malik, uh, who is Professor and Associate Director at Fred Hutch, who has used uh, Review Commons not once, but multiple times. And we are uh, very happy to have him here today to describe a little bit more about the perspective from uh, the author. And so I will just bring up uh, your first slide uh, and hand it over to you, Hermine. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for sharing the genesis of this really cool idea. I wanted to give a very selfish uh, perspective from the author's side, which Thomas already has referred to. Um, we actually started, uh, you know, using uh, with very altruistic intentions. We wanted to support ASAP Bio and this uh, initiative, which is what Paper One refers to, which was our first submission to Review Commons, and it went so well. And then we were hit with a pandemic that essentially we've only published, uh, we've only submitted a paper, one paper outside the Review Commons Pantheon since then. All of our papers have gone in. And partly the reason we sent the other paper outside that was because, you know, that was a very molecular evolution heavy paper, which is something that, you know, there's not as much of a, you know, so if you're a cell molecular developmental biology, uh, you know, scientist, you know, there's like 17 absolutely brilliant journals that are all open access and really there's really no reason to go outside these. Um, I've highlighted a couple of things here. Um, there's lots of data and I'm happy to share this data with ASAP Bio. The first thing is that the review process itself is actually very fast. Um, it, it sort of the median is around uh, 35 days. The only exception was uh, the last manuscript which we submitted four days before Christmas because the postdoc in the lab absolutely wanted to get it off her plate. And obviously that uh, was a more delayed uh, review process because I'm sure everybody was on vacation, including the reviewers. So I don't hold that against, but you can actually see uh, how good that was. I've highlighted a few things in yellow here, which I just want to talk about in brief. Um, only one of these was not posted as a preprint before we submitted to review comments. Um, that had to do with, uh, some paranoia on part of some of the co-authors about the relative sort of sharing of things. Uh, this was, you know, this was something that I was not able to convince the authors of, of doing. In retrospect, it would have absolutely made absolutely no difference, honestly. Um, and certainly at the uh, post review, it would have been very easy to share the preprint. Um, the really nice thing about this feature about the review plan that Sarah referred to is that in many cases, we actually did the revisions because they were either really critical, we thought based on the reviewers comments or they were very minor. So it took very little time for us to do that. And all of these time estimates have to be asterisk because they were actually done in a COVID pandemic with lots of people moving continents, et cetera. So this, this would have been much, much shorter under normal circumstances. 
the most important thing is also like the final uh, stage, which was at the journal review stage in I think four out of the seven cases, there was no additional review. There was no additional consultation with the reviewers. The editors were able to take our revisions and essentially make a decision without any kind of further cycles of review. But the one I have highlighted is actually almost like the best advertisement for how well review comments works which is we got the reviews, we came up with a revision plan. The reviews are very positive, but there was one experiment which we had not been able to do and we're not going to be able to do. There was just like a lot of technical hurdles and in the middle of the pandemic. So we submitted that paper to Ember Reports and it was actually rejected within four days, you know, for, you know, reasons, you know, associated with significance, et cetera. But they suggested a potential transfer to Life Science Alliance, which is a really cool new journal that had just come about. And we consulted with other colleagues who submitted there and we transferred the paper. And it was basically said, if we do the revisions that we had proposed to do, then uh, that journal would be happy to accept it. And indeed that is what happened. So the thing that actually, what is really worth emphasizing from the author perspective is that there's a lot of certainty at every stage of this process. There's certainty that there are not going to be more reviewers. There's certainty that there's not going to be a changing of the landscape where like you send in reviews and revisions and suddenly they change additional things. There's a lot of that certainty and that certainty almost is worth the price of admission here, right? That, that you know kind of where you are. It's not like you're in a stage where you can return to you know, the futile cycles of resubmission and revision. If you can go to the next slide, Jessica, I do have some recommendations which might be a little bit controversial here. Um, one is that, you know, the, the more negative experience that people have had with review commons have been those single click, convenient clicks of submission directly from BioArchive to uh, review commons. And they've complained that that hasn't gone so well than submission to a traditional journal. And I asked them, well, what else did you submit to a traditional journal? And they had a cover letter, and they, they uh, suggested reviewers and editors, all of that stuff doesn't necessarily happen when you just transfer from BioArchive because it just goes into the system. So it's not really an apples to uh, apples comparison. And I would actually recommend that all the papers we submitted to BioArchive, even those that were pre-printed, we actually took the time to write a cover letter and we took the time to personalize that cover letter to the journal that we were targeting. So th there was there was some you know traditional sort of aspects of the process, which are really sort of one of the things that makes the traditional journals even sort of capable of standing up to what Review Commons is able to offer. The best absolute feature was that there were many cases where we did not agree with all the experiments that were proposed by the reviewers, we did agree with many. So we did some, and we said that if this is what the editor requires, we will do them, but we, we think it's outside the scope of the journal. And in five out of seven cases, the editor completely agreed with us. So that just basically saved us four to six months of precious time in a pandemic uh, year that basically uh, saved a lot of uh, angst and anxiety. But as, as we had really no doubt about the certainty of the process at any stage of the process. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Harmit. Um, fantastic to hear these perspectives and tips. Um, I uh, now see that there's quite a few questions coming in. I want to encourage all the attendees to certainly keep them coming, use the Q&A feature. Uh, some of the questions have already been answered. You can browse through the text responses there. But please uh, do continue to add questions to the Q&A uh, and upload those that you find interesting. Um, just a brief note that uh, we do have a presence on Twitter. Um, ReviewComments.org continues to be a source of information. And there's an email address that you can contact as well if you do have a question that is, uh, you know, perhaps more of a one-on-one -on -one type uh, situation. But now um, I want to hand over uh, the uh, microphone to Danielle and Adriana, who will moderate. Thank you, Jessica. Hi, everyone again. Uh, thank you, panelists. That's such an awesome discussion. I'm really looking forward to talking more about this. Um, so I'm here with my co-chair, Adriana San Roman. Uh, we're going to uh, discuss these questions. And I'd, I'd like to first start out with, um, we, we actually had an editor from Cell Press Community Review give a talk at the Whitehead Institute. And uh, their community review process, uh, they you can submit a paper 
to uh, to sell press, but you can also select um, om like if you prefer, you can select every single solitary journal um, under sell press to consider uh, the paper for review. So I kind of wanted to ask, um, since there's a, a limit of only four journals, would you consider having uh, the papers um, looked at by all of the editors at all the journals at the same time? Um, that's a good question. So, so it's this idea where that we call the marketplace, right? That you we review the paper and then it's put for tender to 100 journals at the same time. Um, and to some effect, the, the, the refereed preprint, once it's posted uh, publicly, is exactly that. Every journal is free to, to go there uh, with early evidence base. We, we make it very easy to find what are the new refereed preprints. And, and actually, we tell every, every journal, why don't you go there? Because, you know, th these are easy grabs and you can make a decision actually on the spot, right? You have a refereed preprint, a, a reviewed paper. So in a way, that's that's what we achieved, you know, in a completely general way. Now, we are also a little bit cautious about this idea because what a goal that we have is also to address the scalability and the saturation of the of the publishing process, and we have to think of all the sides at the same time. And sometimes, what is good for on one side is not obligatory good for the other one. And so, of course, from the side of, of an author to have a paper that is considered by 100 editors, I'm joking a bit, but 100 editors at the same time is very pleasing. On the side of the editors, instead of reading the papers that have been submitted, they have to read all the papers. And so I think it's, it's very clear that very quickly there is a scalability issue. And it also then drifts into a selection for behaviors that are not obligatory in the interest of the scientific community. Like, again, to exaggerate a bit to carry the, the, the message, editors will be simulated to wake up very early uh, in the morning in some regions of the world to be the first one to approach the authors and to, to, really, to really see uh, the, the, um, to approach the authors the first. And that's not obligatorily aligned with, with scientific quality and in-depth assessment. So this sort of rat race um, on all the sides and this inflation of competition on the side of the scientists, but also the, the journals, we don't see that always as very positive for, for, for science if it's exaggerated. So we, we realize this marketplace, but with a little bit of caution. Yes, for well, us. Also, if I can add, just to be blunt, you know, um, it's a little bit like submitting, you know, going to independent coffee shops versus Starbucks. Um, you know, you know, the cell system is keeping your paper and the economics all within their system right and there there is some you know efficiency at scale of doing that i mean like kind of like going to starbucks so you know it's also part of our value system i think of uh you know what we value as a scientific community and want to support and um um you know, we are trying to create an alliance of uh, many journals to keep them in the ecosystem. And I think that is uh, what you're also supporting by sending your paper here. Yes, I do agree with that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So we have a question from an anonymous attendee that has been upvoted several times. So. Um, the question is, how can you get involved in Review Commons referee community? That must be for Thomas, right? Yeah, so so there we, it's, a, it's a really good question. And we actually are engaging with, with as a bio right now in the experiment to, to address this issue. Um, how can we recruit younger referees, uh, referees who we do not know obligatorily the name or the reputation, how, how can we engage? We have not done that in a systematical way uh, before and or in, a, in an active and, and forward-looking way. We, we rely really on the, on the network of, of trusted reviews, reviewers that, that we know and, and the editors who handle these papers, they all know from, for their field, their, their, their network of, of referees. We make a strong push to, 
for for PIs to suggest postdocs and, and, and senior scientists and to add their names uh, as co-reviewers or to nominate them and we approach them directly. Uh, that works well, but not well enough. And I think for review comments, we really have to broaden our our network of, of reviewers. Um, we are, of course, quite picky. Uh, it is difficult to review. We want to have the top quality reviewers. Um, so this is not little commenting. This is really serious scientific work. So. So we, we, we are also, I have to say, we want to recruit new reviewers, but we're also very critical about the, the quality of the reviews then that we, that we receive. And so in that sense, I think the, the experiment that um, uh, Azab Bio is doing, and I forgot the code name, feedback, Azab Bio, Azab feedback. Jessica, help me. I, I forgot the, the feedback hashtag. Feedback ASAP. Yeah, okay. I'll, Feed I'll put a link in there. Okay, yeah. feedback ASAP is, is doing exactly that, and I'm quite curious to see how it pans out, yeah. Uh, Thomas, yeah. actually, uh, sorry, uh, just based on one of the questions from Seema Matos, uh, she also was asking about the standards for, for um, the review process, but she also asked specifically if there are any like metrics that qualify for review, if you just want to go a little bit further Ooh, you... the metrics of the reviews this is super no there is none but we we try to develop them so we we have a couple of ideas how to use ai and, and natural language processing to analyze the the content of the reviews and be able to report some kind of principal metrics of how these reviews are and uh, whether they are rich whether they are complex where they uh, have many points whether they are in depth and so on whether they are possible bias and to detect also language uh, and tone uh, excesses or, or, or artifacts so there is nothing like that that really exists and i think it's very urgent now to develop that because we have transparent review and also because we have community review where there is no real regulation where anybody can review. And I think it's very important that we conserve the, the quality and we can measure that. Okay, so we've got some other questions about kind of how it works. So people are asking if there's any fee in, associated with this peer review service. Not yet. It's free for all, but not. Uh, it we we are, we are working very hard to convince funders uh, to support their 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 fundees uh, to to publish a free preprint. We think this is a total game changer. So we really want to keep that um, completely seamless for authors. We engage, of course, the journals. Uh, and we are setting up a business model now to, to make uh, the, the platform uh, sustainable. So far, it was um, funded by the Helmsley uh, Trust uh, Foundation. Uh, but the, the, so we are now transitioning towards a, a more sustainable uh, model that involves both funders and the journals. We would like that it remains free, of course, for the authors. Can I, in that context, ask the audience a question? Um, and you may guess why I'm asking this question, but it's an interesting one. And again, we care about what the community wants. Some funders, and you know this from the press, you know this from all sorts of sides. Um, and in fact, the community feels that the posting of the referees reports with the preprints is very important. I mentioned that in my uh, at the beginning. Can we hear from you? Who of you, this is the audience, not the panel, obviously, who of you would be prepared to go to review comments if you if posting of the ref referees reports with your answer with your rebuttal letter was mandated i jessica um danielle etc i don't know how you adriana i don't know how you want to do this you can do but can we can we just give a quick poll as to question if review comments mandates a priori, when you submit, that you will post the referee's comments with your I, rebuttal letter. Do you I have will. something else in mind, Jessica? No, no, I will just try over it to you. you. I'll make a, I will make a question. I will make a poll okay. and then launch it. Into Thank you. Yeah. Over to you. Yeah. Great. Um, so I have a, a question that's also was asked by another anonymous attendee, uh, but is 
uh, considering the blinded fashion of review process, you're, you don't really have that with pre-current service. So are you considering doing, you know, a double blinded fashion? Um, yes, we, we are considering it. There, there are some kind of practical issues to, 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 to be compatible with the policy of every journal. And we have 17 journals and we would like to have 50 journals and gets a little bit hairy to be compatible with, with all of that. I think double blind is the standard in computational science. Um, so there is certainly a value to that. We, we know that there, is, there are regional or geographical biases um, and name bias. They're difficult to measure, but there is a sense that they exist. Um, at the journals, at our, our experience at Temple Press, we offer double blind since a while and practically nobody takes it up. So there is a strong desire a priori in principle to, to, to have double blind, but when faced to it, actually it seems that it's not as popular as one would have expected. I think it's a cultural thing in, in the life sciences. Let me launch the poll. Uh, all right. um, Michelle just asked a question may, which may affect this poll, and I just wonder if someone should answer that. Uh, Michelle has sent us, uh, uh, if, I, if I may, um, willingness may hinge on whether review signing is also mandated. Um, so uh, it seems like the review signing would not be mandated. Please correct. Uh, no, no, no. The the review signing would would not be mandated. We uh, we welcome uh, people to sign their their reviews if they want, but I don't think. No, we we have no plan. Uh, we we like actually anonymous peer review because it it lets people be be critical. Oh. Yeah, what I, I should say that could influence in real time the poll is that if we mandate, we would like to have a formal process to be defined that would allow authors to challenge in some form some bad reviews. There is a very small fraction of reviews that use offensive language, inappropriate language, and these are clear cases where a review can be damageable if it's made public or, or transferred to a, to a journal. And we, we have to have some kind of correction process. And we, can, we will never be able to, to guarantee 100% of perfect, wonderful review. There, there is always some kind of noise. Of course, this is very tricky to, to set up. We have to find criteria, but I would like to say that if we mandate referee preprint, we would like to associate that with some kind of um, process, formal process, that allow authors to to challenge a report or, or, or to, you know, to see, to save the, the situation. So I'll leave it on a room. For, oh, I just want ahead. to say I'll leave the poll open for about 10, 15 more seconds and then I'll close it. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, so on a related note, we had another uh, anonymous question about whether authors are allowed to appeal or request uh, other referees during the review commons process. And so I think from what I interpreted right now, you're saying that there's not currently a mechanism, but you're looking into creating one. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's correct. Because at the moment, it's not mandatory to, to post the reviews. And then we consider that even if, you are, if there is a, a questionable review, uh, since you are seen by a single journal, so it's not like you are showing to 70 journals at the same time, you can make your point. It's not ideal, but we, we don't have an appeal process. Um, and it's sort of a very normal, if you get bad reviews at the journal, well, you have to make your arguments and, and argue with the editors. And, and here it's the same. It's a different topic, of course, when you're making the, the, the reviews public before publication. All right, the results are in from the poll. Hopefully you can see them all. Can, okay, I see some reactions, <laughs> Yes, uh, 
So uh, going into another question. Um, so we have a great, an, a great array of uh, journals that have already uh, teamed up with Review Commons, which is awesome. Um, but uh, currently it's mostly focused in biological sciences. So do you think there's going to be an expansion into the other fields? Do you think you're going to be able to accommodate like nature and science? Do you think you're gonna be able to get them on board? Sarah, do you want to? Oh, you're muted. I, I, I think it's you, Thomas. I mean, it's oh, obvious well, okay. that, <laughs> that's what uh, that's what would be ideal. I mean, some journals feel it's quite strange. I mean, you you come across the strangest discoveries when you you know in this process. Some journals feel that they are so proud of their own reviewer pool that they couldn't possibly. Uh, trust the Embo Press reviewer pool. Now, this is pretty crazy because the people are the same people. We all have access to the same people. It's also true that, of course, not everybody reviews for everything. But since we disclose the reviewers to the receiving journal, that does not seem uh, totally valid. Although having heard even from places like eLife, edit, senior editors of eLife, you know, if you don't know the people who do the refereeing, um, then it's harder to judge. So, but there are considerations by others. For the moment, we've kept it. Uh, one condition for, for joining is that you subscribe to some of the values that we have and some of the pr procedures and processes, namely public posting on the journal site, you know, transparent review, the whole transparent review process. So that's kept from, but Thomas, you go on. No, I, I think you, you said correctly, yes. Yeah, so there is addition to the core values, which is, you know, avoid these this, uh, cycles of peer review, to consider reviews, to make ed editorial decisions, coordinate with review comments and, and, and post eventually the, the, the reviews, and of course, to support preprint. Now, the exp expansion of the scope, yes, we want to expand the scope. I think we are definitely going to remain in the life sciences. I don't think we can now uh, contemplate to go in social science, mathematics, or physics, but we certainly welcome, you know, uh, similar uh, initiatives in those fields. Now, the culture there is completely different. Preprint are, you know, a classic mode of communication in physics and, and, and mathematics. So the, the, the issues are completely different. In the life sciences, we want to expand the scope. Um, we are very conscious that this is cell and molecular biology oriented. This is our expertise and we, we started. We want to expand to more medically oriented fields, but also to, to other fields that are underrepresented, in particular neuroscience. Uh, that is very urgent. Uh, evolution and, and ecology certainly certainly as well. The challenge is to scale the the, the the editorial team running this peer review, inviting the reviews and having the expertise to recruit them. And, and uh, we have to, to be careful that we can still deliver a good service. Our priority is really to deliver a high quality peer review that can be used as is by, by the participating journals. But also, maybe I could put things in, you know, in the big picture here, you know, uh, as Marie and I or started, you know, talked about this, this came up as an idea. This first stage of review commons uh, was really an experiment. I mean, and uh, from many points of view, you know, and Thomas presented the data, but, you know, would the community come? What was the quality of peer reviewing? Would journals as an affiliate, really kind of the first time that's been done you know, work effectively as a consortium. So we, you know, we went through this phase, which I think was, you could view as an experiment. And, you know, now we're really looking, I think both EMBO, ASAP Bio, but also all of you, I mean, the whole scientific community of what is the next stage of this project. And um, so, you know, I do think this is kind of a very pivotal and exciting time where we are beginning to think, you know, what does the next version of Review Commons look like? How will it be uh, sustainable? How can more journals come on? And, you know, how do we increase 
the community, community being authors and reviewers around it. So in the spirit of what Maria says, like, you know, kind of we need the community also to help in this next phase of the journey. Um, and, you know, it's, it was great. I, I loved hearing Harmeet's uh, talk and, um, but that's kind of the spirit that we need if we want to, you know, take this to the next stage. And I'm hoping that the, you know, the Whitehead group is going to be on board with us in that journey too, because um, uh, this has to continue in the spirit of a community driven project. The boss of the Whitehead is sort of sitting on the edge of her chair to say something here. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I just want to follow up on what Ron just said, because uh, I think it's really important um, to just make this more public. And I think what you're doing, what we did today was really, really important. Um, I, I did my little research and I know that uh, uh, almost all labs at Whitehead are posting on bioarchives. So there's clearly many people do this, but I think review comments is sort of, there's still a step to just um, make that more obvious to people, right? So I think it's amazing how fast it went to for bioarchive to be acceptable. Um, people are thinking about it. And so I think the uh, review comments idea has to um, be um, you know, communicated uh, and, and I think we can all help with that, right? And, and I think meetings like today are really, really important. So I thank everyone and especially um, uh, Adriana and, and, and Danielle for, 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 for bringing it to the Whitehead and for you, all of you to, uh, um, to speak so freely about it. And I, I think Harmit's example is just really great because it really speaks for itself. Um, so thanks everyone. Thank you. Um, and, and really, Maria and Ron, I really appreciate how you're continuing to progress the field. So we really appreciate that. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, if you have additional questions, you can actually refer to contact at reviewcommons.org um, for, for additional um, help. And I just want to thank all of the panelists and also Ruth for joining us today. So thank you very much. Just to add, I have to totally reiterate what Danielle just said. The questions that were asked were really, really good, and we want to answer them. So please do write in. You'll get extended answers or chats or whatever. It's a shame we couldn't answer them all here. So please get back to us. Thank you all. Have a great day.